it's going to give me a light here. I don't think so. All right, everyone, uh, welcome back. Photographer and filmmaker Jeffrey Garriac once said that with the pleasure of working in the travel and conservation space, often locations that are inaccessible to most of us, came the tremendous responsibility of accurately representing the people, wildlife, environments, and issues that he experienced. From subjects as diverse as the Chernobyl nuclear plant to Macedonia's Roma community to whale sharks, Jeffrey carries this responsibility with grace, grit, and the heart of a storyteller. As he says, we are constantly bombarded by issues. Visual storytelling makes it easier to make the investment of time and connect emotionally in the stories we need to tell. As a member of Photographers Without Borders, he works to tell stories like Love the Oceans, focused on a small community in Mozambique that finds empowerment through developing sustainable tourism. He takes that ethic, that challenge, to support community-led initiatives and change makers and tell their stories of social and environmental justice where it is most needed. Says his colleagues at Photographers Without Borders, Danielle Da Silva, Jeff makes extraordinary visions come to life with his technical talents and unique skill sets. Perhaps the project that most encompasses Jeffrey's passions is Galapagos, Secrets of the Ocean Giants. The film follows scientists with the Galapagos Whale Shark Project working around Darwin Island as they seek to uncover the movements of our largest ocean fish. The film, a finalist at the International Wildlife Film Festival, is credited with helping to establish that migratory corridor that we discussed earlier today, a huge swath of ocean between Ecuador's Galapagos and Costa Rica's Cocos Islands. That was no small feat. When Jeffrey isn't dangling from helicopters, diving in minus two degree water, trekking at altitude while carrying pounds and pounds of gear, he can be found in Sharjah. This is Jeffrey's second visit to exposure. So please welcome him back to the stage for the conservation lens. Might be the nicest introduction I've ever had. Thank you very much. All right. I would like to ask a simple sounding question that I thought I definitely knew the answer to, and that's, is this an ocean conservation photo? I think this is the sort of thing we imagine when we think about an ocean conservation photo. It's a majestic looking humpback whale, the light is nice, it's a sympathetic animal that we can all agree needs protecting. But in isolation, there isn't much of a story. The story of the photo on its own is, here's a humpback whale, so let's try something else. There's an ocean conservation photo, right? Granted, the ocean isn't in it, and there's no wildlife, but it's a story we're all familiar with. Ocean plastics washing up on the beach, and for context, I'll tell you that these are volunteers with the NGO that Kathy mentioned, love the oceans, picking up, weighing, and logging all the waste that they find to help paint an accurate picture of the ocean plastics crisis in East Africa. Let's go a step further. Is this an ocean conservation photo? I don't know if it looks the part. We have water, but out of context, this could be a kid at a pool party. But this photo illustrates an important point for me because I promise what's happening in it is an important part of conserving our oceans, but requires a lot of accompanying storytelling to have an impact. We'll come back to this one. How about this? Kids in class, looks like maybe a developing country, interested in the lesson, judging by the raised hands, and we could make the link to conservation through education. Maybe they're learning about conservation. However, that's just a guess, and this one needs a lot of heavy lifting for context as well. One more. Now, last one, this looks like a construction photo. There's no ocean in sight, no familiar narrative, no link from education, no majestic wildlife. But I would argue that this is an ocean conservation photo, and I think all of them are because this is also a critical component 
in an important ocean conservation story in Jangamo, Mozambique. This is an initiative that's spearheaded by Love the Oceans, founded by the brilliant Francesca Trotman, who took a very important step in her work by engaging, involving, and most importantly, centering the voices of the local community and listening to them. In particular, a man named Pascal, who I would like for all of us to have a listen to right now. Antes de organizar a Love the Ocean, eu trabalhava como biscateiro, assim como pescador. And this is my house. Isso principalmente naqueles pescadores que usam rede. Aqueles é que fazem uma maldade na água. As redes às vezes têm estado na água por mais dias. Os animais são pegos e volta a apodrecer antes de sair. O nosso ecoturismo começou a cair depois que a empresa de Vijatabai perdeu o seu proprietário. Desde ali então, a nossa área tornou-se vulnerável à pesca. A sustentabilidade da pesca na comunidade tem ido bem em períodos, não quase todo o tempo. A maioria do tempo, o maré está temos mau tempo e não conseguimos entrar, mas nos dias em que o maré está bom, conseguimos sustentar as nossas famílias. So how do we get from here to conserving these oceans? To hear Pascal tell it, Pascal was born and raised in Changamo, in this community, and has become an enormous champion for the oceans there. The majority of the unsustainable fishing practices are due to gill nets like these. These stay in the ocean overnight, catch indiscriminately, and often float off into sea and are unrecoverable in bad weather. So that can be an ecological disaster. How do you stop gill nets? One solution, we talked about it a little bit in our panel discussion earlier in the day, would be to create a marine protected area here, which would outlaw fishing like this. But it's not as easy as just declaring something an MPA. So Pascal and Love the Oceans had to take on a huge swath of different activities since the road to a marine protected area doesn't run exclusively through the oceans. The first question was, if the fishermen couldn't fish, what could they do? And so a common suggestion that's worked as a solution in the past is to work in tourism, where the ocean can be appreciated without being exploited. And this means working, like I mentioned earlier, as dive masters, snorkeling instructors, boat captains, but all of these are water-based activities, and that means that you need to be a competent swimmer. And there's quite a strong riptide in Ginjada Bay and the neighboring bays, and so without strong swimming skills, it can be quite risky to get into the ocean. And it's bad enough that many locals have died trying to do this. So Love the Oceans instituted free swimming lessons for anyone in the community who was interested. And if the community was going to appreciate the ocean, they were going to have to get to know it. But it's not as simple as just competency in swimming. All of these jobs in tourism require a level of education that doesn't exist now in the area. And so this meant looking at schools. The nearest high school for most of these kids, it was more than two hours driving away, which meant if you didn't have the means to rent a room in the town the school was in, your education stops at age 14. The government said they would only facilitate a high school in the region if each of the primary schools had 10 classrooms. So, Love the Oceans started fundraising to build classrooms and then started building them. And all of a sudden, you're doing ocean conservation here, buying concrete and paying local laborers on the ground doing the work. And it's because of efforts like this that I think marine protected areas can be sustainable long term. Because if you involve the community, 
and you let the community lead the charge, and give them a sense of pride of something that they've developed, that is how these efforts succeed in the long term. When we leave, these folks will stay, as they always have, and have a sense of stewardship. So, I think all of these are ocean conservation photos, because it turns out for me anyway, ocean conservation doesn't always look like how I pictured it. So, most of the folks who spoke today need very little introduction, but I'm going to provide you a little more about myself just to help you understand how I arrived here in Mozambique contemplating what constitutes ocean conservation. I've always been a filmmaker, but I broke into the industry working in sports in Toronto a long way from ocean conservation. And I was never a sports fan before, but I have become quite a big one and I've worked very hard to live up to the Canadian stereotype of being a diehard hockey fan, go Leafs go. But what I always wanted to do was travel. I wanted to make images for National Geographic, which is why it is such a treat for me to share the stage with so many of my distinguished colleagues today. After a few years, I got lucky and I broke into the travel and tourism industry working for a company called G Adventures. And thanks to them, I was able to see the world and I was given a front row seat to the effects, both positive and negative, of tourism on our planet. And it was about then that I started working for a not-for-profit called Photographers Without Borders, which introduced me to the grassroots efforts that NGOs around the world take towards protecting civil liberties and promoting education and, of course, conservation. And so it was from this palette of viewpoints that I realized something had changed since I was a young, wide-eyed kid watching Blue Planet. I always wanted to shoot natural history and wildlife, and now that was completely inseparable from conservation. And so I decided since you can't be a wildlife filmmaker without being a conservationist, you might as well do your best to try and be good at both. So tourism, that was my first view into the conservation space. And for many, tourism is the enemy of conservation. People will draw a direct link between the presence of tourists and the spoiling of a particular environment or a monument or a species. Here in Iceland, in the north of Iceland, this is a place called the Dimiborger or the Dark Castles, where in ancient times a volcano had its lava flow roll over a lake, and as the lake boiled and evaporated, the stone erupted upwards and created all of these towers and beautiful archways. And it's unfortunately been becoming a casualty of Instagram because some people seem to think that the finest photos are climbing onto the side and climbing onto the top, and these lava structures are very brittle and very fragile, and they won't survive much of that. Camping is, can be another enemy of conservation if it's not done correctly. If you follow leave no trace practices and you're careful to take out everything that you take in, it can be a wonderful thing and a brilliant experience. But if not done sustainably, you risk damage to single sites that are used again and again. You change the behaviors of the wildlife around you. And this, the dreaded wildlife selfie, is one of the great enemies of conservation. A, because it encourages people to interact with wildlife in a very unsustainable way, and B, because especially in a place like Antarctica where there are no land predators, it, it completely can change the behavior of a number of different species. And the problem with this is that it promotes other people to want the same type of photo and chase the same type of photo, and it becomes an exponential drive for these types of photos. But tourism does not have to be the enemy of conservation. I think that tourism can very often, when done the right way, be a force for good. And so I would like to play you the voices of Natasha van Gessel, who works at Palmer Station in Antarctica as a researcher, and Jonathan Green, who's a friend of mine who I met uh, when he was expedition leader on the G expedition on a ship that I first traveled to Antarctica on to talk a little bit about what the positive impacts of tourism can be.
So you asked about the importance of tourists in Antarctica, and I think they're actually really, really important. It's so exciting for me to, to talk to tourists, and because they are excited about being here. And I just think that whenever they come here and they see for themselves how beautiful and pristine it is, and just overall, that they, they bring this experience back, and they will be a spokesperson for what's happening um, you know, globally, because what Antarctica is kind of, certain areas are in peril of climate change, and there's still a lot of skepticism out there. And if people see for themselves how quickly the glaciers are retreating and all that, I just think that's really, really valuable. And just to have them see the pristineness of this area, it just makes them appreciate our planet even more. And I think that's really, really important. An ambassador for Antarctica is someone who's been to Antarctica and finally realizes the importance of this place, the, the importance of conserving, preserving it for the future. What we're creating is awareness. So we hope that these people will go back from Antarctica having lived an impossible dream and they'll spread the word about the importance of preserving places, these great wildernesses. Because if we don't have awareness, then there will be no future for uh, conservation. Antarctica is inaccessible for, I would guess, 99% of the human population. And anything that's out of sight, out of mind, is in danger of being forgotten about and therefore exploited and not preserved for the future. And I think the more people that know about it, the much higher the opportunity or the uh, possibility that we'll take care of Antarctica. So to echo the sentiments of them and to quote Alexander von Humboldt, nature must be experienced through feeling. And personal experience isn't the only way that tourism and conservation interact. I think when it's done the right way, it can even be a helpful contributor to science. In Antarctica, for example, on the ship that I work on, we try and engage travelers in as much citizen science as possible. So as we cross the Drake Passage, to reach the continent from South America, we'll take people up on deck, weather permitting, of course, and we will do a bird survey, which is sort of equal parts tourism, data gathering, and education. So the drake is home to the amazing wandering albatross, which is the greatest known wingspan of any living bird. And sometimes you're very lucky to get a close encounter to really understand. It's hard without scale, but I promise you these wings are staggering, even at a great distance. The Drake's also home to the black-browed albatross, and if you're lucky, you may also see giant petrels in these waters, which are a very strange looking, and can be a very mean bird, but really amazing to see. And so counting these birds provides insight into their movements, into their population size, and it's an opportunity to educate people on some of their bizarre behaviors. Actually, I'll go, I'll go back, like um, unihemispheral shortwave sleep is something I learned about when I was, uh, in Antarctica, and this is a very bizarre practice that uh, these albatross do, and dolphins do it as well, where because they're at sea flying for days and weeks and months, and they don't have the luxury of being able to stop to sleep, what they actually do is they put one hemisphere of their brain to sleep and sort of go on cruise control for several miles, and then they put the other hemisphere of their brain to sleep when they're finished, and then wake up for the complicated parts of life. Something I wish that I could do. And it's not just birds that we involve people with in science, it's whales as well. So the most common that you see in Antarctica are humpbacks, but uh, as we saw earlier, the fin whales are beginning to return to Antarctica as well, which is a great joy. I've seen a couple of fin whales, but never a group that size. This was my encounter with a fin whale. We saw a, a small group of three, and for that, even that was a thing to celebrate the years ago that I was there. To, so to see a group like we saw in one of the previous presentations, absolutely brilliant. Sometimes you get a curious minky. Most of the time they pop up like this and then vanish. Every now and then you'll have one like this one chase your boat around for the full hour, which is a wonderful experience. They're often as curious about us as we are about them. And uh, of course, on a very special occasion, we can have orca, though. Of course, they're a member of the dolphin family rather than the whale family. Now, 
these animals provide an amazing opportunity for citizen science. And this, full disclosure, is not a photo from Antarctica, but it's a little bit better of an example for what I'm talking about. It's a really good opportunity to take advantage of something that travelers are doing anyway, which is trying to take a photo that looks like this. So there's a wonderful citizen science project called Happy Whale. And Happy Whale is a website where you can take a photo from anywhere in the world that you have taken or that someone has taken of a whale tail like this and submit it. And that's because the patterns that you see on the underside of the fin and the patterns that you see on the edge of the tail fin are like a human fingerprint and they can be used to positively identify these animals. And so if you take a photo and you tell them when and where it was taken, if that same individual was sighted again, they will let you know. And it's a way of tracking the movements of some of these whales without having to get into the water and tag them with difficult procedures, expensive satellite tags, and then monitoring. This is something that anybody with a camera can participate in. And this is what some of those journeys will look like when you go to keep up on your whale. And if you're the first person to discover the whale, they will even let you name it. There are a number of other programs that we run on this ship, and we, we survey clouds, we take water samples, we work with phytoplankton, and that's just our ship. Most ships operating in the Antarctic have ways of engaging travelers in science, and the more you learn about something, as Jonathan said, the more inclined you are to preserve, conserve, and protect it. But of course, the bulk of conservation work is being done by scientists and researchers and explorers. And increasingly, the photographers and filmmakers have a part to play. So when I started working for myself, after I left my travel job, I started getting involved more with science. And I became a collaborator on expeditions and exploration, and conservation, and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And through that, I've been introduced to some really brilliant work uh, preserving deep water corals in the Chilean fjords through the work of Freni Hauserman, examining the impact of microbiological life on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, and what that means for climate change through the work of Joseph Cook. He has a theory that a lot of climate change models haven't fully taken into consideration some of the microbiological life on the Greenland ice sheet, and therefore our models may not be exactly what we imagine them to be. And finding new habitats altogether in caves previously unknown to science, thanks to Francesco Soro. The scientific viewpoint in conservation stories has always been important. But what's beginning to change, I think, is who it's important for. Many scientists that I've worked with have told me that multimedia is now a critical part of field work. And the way it was put to me was, if we write a paper on our findings, it'll be read by six people in our field who already agree, and nothing will change. If we make a film about it, it might be watched by 6,000 people from all walks of life who feel like they want to do something about it. And filmmaking is also a great vehicle for explaining complex ideas in a simple way. I find with photography, you need to show and then tell. And while that can be a wonderful combination in the Instagram, TikTok, Instagram gratification environment that we live in, often the patience doesn't exist for the accompanying text to a photo, which is a shame. We see the photo, we like the photo, and we move on. And so appetite for video is growing constantly. And I think that's because you can both show and tell in the same moment. So let me give you an example. If you have a casual interest in biology, you'll have heard of scientists tagging animals. I thank Simon Pierce, my collaborator, for this photo. I did not take this photo. And I always knew that tagging animals was something that scientists did, but it wasn't explicitly clear why they were doing it. I had a loose understanding that these devices were for tracking animals, but beyond that, I didn't know. And so this is a great opportunity, I think, for conservation filmmaking to fill in the gaps for you. So I'd like you to watch Jonathan Green explain exactly how these tags work and what he hopes to achieve by using them on whale sharks in the Galapagos. This is actually what the hybrid tag looks like. So this is the double tag that we're putting on the fin, the actual dorsal fin of the whale shark. The two tags, this is the spot tag, here we have the mini flat, serve two different purposes. So the spot tag basically gives us 
the position every single time that whale shark comes to the surface. So it has a sensor here. This is a wet-dry sensor. Together with the antenna, these basically detect the moment that that tag is above the surface. So any time that the whale shark comes close to the surface, this will then transmit position to the Argos satellite system, and we will receive a message telling us exactly where on the surface of the ocean that tag or that whale shark may be at that moment. However, what's happening in between times, between those messages underwater, we don't know. And for that reason, we have this tag here, the mini pad tag, which is recording not only the diving, uh, the vertical movements, it records time at depth, so we know more or less how long it's spending at each one of those depths, and it's also recording the temperature down there. So we build up from these two tags, on this hybrid tag, a very complete 3D history of what the whale shark is actually doing. So this data will show the movements not only on the horizontal plane, but also on the vertical plane. So we'll be able to see what they're doing, where they're diving specifically. So if they're diving on particular features, and hopefully with that kind of data, we can then suggest areas that need to be protected, so played into marine protected areas. And whale sharks, of course, are protected areas like Galapagos, so whilst they're within the marine reserve, they're protected in this area. But the moment they move out of the marine reserve, uh, the industrial fishing fleets are waiting very, very closely nearby. So they're now being targeted by fishing fleets, and unless we can protect them throughout their reproductive or life, throughout their life cycle, unfortunately, they really have no future. So that brings us neatly to the Galapagos, where I think everything that we've been talking about intersects. Conservation is at work here through science, through community, and through tourism, thanks in part to one incredible animal, the whale shark. So in 2019, while working in Antarctica, I met Jonathan, and we became friends. He's a part-time Antarctic expedition leader, part-time whale shark researcher, very interesting person. And I visited the Galapagos Islands for the first time later that year to be introduced to his organization, the Galapagos Whale Shark Project. And so Jonathan lectures in the community on his work with whale sharks, as well as leading liveaboard diving trips in the islands with an emphasis on whale shark education. And so I was fortunate enough to join them on a science expedition to Darwin Island, and I made a film about it. Well, Darwin is a strange mystery for whale shark researchers. The Animals they see here are 99% female. They're almost always 10 meters in length or longer. And they arrive to Darwin. They stay 24 to 48 hours. And then they leave. And no one's entirely sure why. I was fortunate to be able to join the research team as they traveled to Darwin to try and unlock some of the answers to these questions. And I would like to show you a clip of the film. The film is screening here at Exposure, so if you're lucky to go by the a cinema that they have in the adjoining section. You might be able to see it. But I'd love to play you just a short clip right now to give you some context on the work being done. The Galapagos Marine Reserve plays host to many incredible migratory species, none quite so impressive as the whale shark. Often weighing more than nine tons, they are the ocean's largest fish. These incredible animals are well protected here in Galapagos, but spend most of their lives in the open ocean. These islands provide a rare platform from which we can study one of the least understood animals on our planet. Jonathan Green is a naturalist who's worked in the Galapagos for more than three decades. His time here has been largely spent underwater, trying to shed light on the mysteries of these ocean giants. It's important that we understand whale sharks, and in order to understand whale sharks, we must study them. Without baseline data, without a full understanding of their natural history, you can't really attempt to protect them for the future. We know that whale sharks have been fished for thousands of years but obviously by small native communities, they've taken very small numbers. Unfortunately, during the 1980s, the 1990s, they've become a large part of the bycatch of industrial fisheries, and now they've actually become a goal of industrial fisheries as well. They're being taken for their fins, they're being taken for their oil, and they've been taken in numbers which could possibly be 
thousands or tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands each year. We just don't know. Jonathan has assembled a team of the world's foremost whale shark researchers in an effort to better understand these creatures so that they can be protected not just here in Galapagos, but around the world. These efforts will take the team north aboard a small scientific vessel to the most remote reaches of the Galapagos Islands. that one can encounter whale sharks as they transit these waters. Small independent production, so we couldn't get David Attenborough, so you have to put up with my voice doing a terrible impression. <laughs> the last thing I want to talk about today is the importance of hope. The news cycle these days has a lot of grim pronouncements on the forthcoming end of the world, and many of the stories we hear about our environment are stories of loss. Loss of species, loss of habitat, and loss of hope. And this is because these things are true. We are losing species and we are losing habitat, but I would encourage you not to lose hope because hope is a great driver of effort. It encourages people to care. It invites you to imagine a better future. And I think it's very hard to dedicate yourself to anything if you can't imagine a better future. So how, as creators, can we manifest hope? I think we can talk about winds. In Mozambique, love the oceans, has its classrooms and is getting a high school. They're going to convert the school in a nearby community into a high school, and then the two local schools are going to become a primary and a secondary school, respectively, so education will be available for kids in all three communities up to the age of 18. That's a win. In Ecuador, the Galapagos Whale Shark Project, as Kathy mentioned earlier, we were able to provide tracking data of a shark tagged on one of their expeditions, using the long hypothesized swimway from Galapagos to Cocos. And at the UN Climate Change Conference in November, Ecuador declared it was going to expand its marine park boundary to protect the swimway between Galapagos and Cocos as part of a joint international effort with Costa Rica. That's a win. How else can we manifest hope? We can talk about leaving viewers with something actionable and tangible to do. You can donate here to these people. You can volunteer here doing this job. Maybe you can do a beach cleanup. Maybe you can take photographs for Happy Whale because ocean conservation affects everybody, whether you live by the ocean or not. But I think the most important thing is to talk about it all because bringing these conversations to a broader audience, increasingly the responsibility for that is going to fall on us, on content creators, photographers, writers, and creatives of all stripes. So we need to go tell these stories, and wherever we tell them, we need to center the voices of the local community. We need to encourage visitors to travel there with purpose. We need to amplify the voices of our scientists and the wider scientific community, and make sure no matter how bleak things may seem, we need to continue to find reasons to be hopeful. Thanks very much. <laughs>